today at the National Press Club, the Chief Defence Scientist, Professor Tanya Munro. She'll speak on how the science of defence and the defence industries impact the Australian community. Professor Tanya Munro with today's National Press Club address in Canberra. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia and today's Westpac address. My name is Sabra Lane, I am the club's president. I'm also the presenter of the ABC Radio Current Affairs program AM. Today's guest is Australia's Chief Scientist, Professor Tanya Munro. If you're following the conversation online, you'll find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club AUST. You can use the hashtag NPC. Everybody, please welcome Professor Munro. Sabra, thank you for that kind introduction. First, I'd like to acknowledge that this is National Reconciliation Week and that Reconciliation Australia has reminded us that whether in crisis or in reconciliation, we are in this together. And it's important to show respect to country wherever we are. Today, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have contributed to the defence of Australia in times of war and peace, and acknowledge that they are indeed some of our very first scientists and engineers and innovators. Ladies and gentlemen, since 2011, nine people have had the privilege to deliver the Ralph Slatcher Address. This esteemed group has included distinguished professors, a former Prime Minister and a leading public servant. And I'm delighted to be the 10th speaker to usher this series into a new decade. My sincere gratitude to Tony Peacock for the invitation to speak today. And I would like to acknowledge the staff of the CRC Association and the Board of Directors superbly led by Belinda Robinson. I'd also like to start by thanking the National Press Club, particularly Chief Executive Officer Maurice Riley, the management team, President Sabra Lane and the Board of Directors. I'd like to acknowledge warmly that we have Ralph Slutch's son Tony here today. Thank you, Tony, for coming for to address in honour of your father. Thank you to the members of the press here present and to Australia's watching from home. As I mentioned today, through the tradition of this address, we honour the memory of Ralph Slutcher. And while the face of the speaker changes year on year, we are all charged with reflecting on science and society. Science draws people together and harnesses ideas to solve some of our biggest problems. Science has transformed lives and taken us from being nomads to agrarian societies right through to today's deeply connected world. Science has lifted us out of poverty, cured diseases and put man on the moon. What is science? Well, it's the ability to predict, to analyse, to observe and to experiment. And in the process, it's very exciting because we extend the limits of knowledge. We develop new technologies and we solve problems. It is the nature of science to challenge orthodoxies, question the established order, and upend the status quo. For example, Copernicus's contention that the planets and the earth circled the sun caused theological consternation for centuries and led to Galileo being under house arrest for life. And in fact, it wasn't until 1992 that he was formally cleared by the Vatican. Einstein's utterly transformational theory of general relativity never did win him a Nobel Prize. And Darwin's notions of natural selection were considered heretical by some. We do continue to be fascinated by science. I think this is because it allows us to channel our instinctive curiosity and our creativity. I see science as the art of the possible, of what might be. Science in itself is not an unadulterated force for good. It can be abused and misused. 
As Shakespeare said, there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. But at its heart, science is the search for truth and for solutions. This search pulls us together in a cooperative way to solve problems. And the collaborative nature of science is something that Professor Slatcher understood well. It is why he championed the concept of Australia's world-renowned cooperative research centre scheme. And in doing so, Professor Slatcher, I would say, was ahead of his time. He appreciated the increasingly complex challenges of the future require the distinct strengths of academia, industry and government all to come together for a common cause. Today, I'll be showing you how defence science is doing just that, bringing together the interdisciplinary expertise from across our nation to undertake mission-oriented research and solve some of Australia's most pressing problems. So, to honour this event's tradition reflecting on science and society, today I would like to explore defence science within an Australian context. But first, a few words about Professor Slatcher. Ralph was initially appointed by Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser as chair of the Australian Science and Technology Council, or ASTEC. This part-time position was essentially the PM's chief science advisor. And when Bob Hawke's Labor Party came to power, he decided to keep Ralph on. Hawke wanted to have an advisor on tap full time, and he established the Prime Minister's Science Council and Coordination Committee. 18 months after Ralph finished as chair of Aztec, he accepted the first ever role for chief scientist for Australia, a role that Alan Finkel performs so capably today. The chief scientist provides that advice to the PM and other senior ministers. They champion Australian science and promote it overseas and make sure that Australians growing up have the opportunity to benefit from learning science at high levels. It's fair to say it's a tough gig, but it's one that Ralph did masterfully with poise and discernment. A very small part of Ralph's legacy was the way he set me on my career trajectory. As I mentioned, one of Ralph's uh, lasting legacies was establishing the Cooperative Research Centre scheme. One of the very first centres was in the field of photonics, looking at how Australia could develop some of the technologies that could be used to improve telecommunications. Now, as a student, I was excited by physics and I loved maths. I was intrigued by the study of forces and energy, of nature and the universe, of space and time. But I wanted it to be real. I wanted to be able to link my intellectual inquiry with tangible outcomes. Luckily for me, I had the opportunity to do that within the Photonic CRC. It was a vibrant environment in which young research scientists could work together with engineers in industry to take ideas and to pull them through into tangible, real outcomes. For me, that experience was a revelation, an awakening. I found myself realising that I could create ideas that made a difference. And soon after, my PhD landed me in the UK. I went to work at the University of Southampton with the research group that arguably um, developed the optical fibres used for telecommunication systems today. Like the very veins and arteries that carry blood around our circulatory systems, optical fibres do this for telecommunications, carrying vast amounts of data around our globe. Now, we must have been doing something right because every week industry came banging on my door. And equipped with this experience, I came back to Australia, to the University of Adelaide in South Australia, to work with the Defence Science and Technology Organisation as it was known then. My mission was to establish a photonics research centre that developed some of the optical materials, optical fibres, sensors and new kinds of lasers that Australia needs for its defence interests. One of the very earliest projects defence proposed was to see whether we could use light to monitor corrosion within aircraft. Now, to do this, 
we had to work very hard to create an interdisciplinary team over a decade that led to them some quite surprising and unexpected discoveries and outcomes. For example, the development of water quality sensors, of virus diagnostics and smart IVF incubators. But perhaps most critically of all, being in South Australia, we developed smart bungs that could sense the maturation of wine in barrels. <laughs> Throughout all of this, I learnt two things. And the first is that when researchers work hand in hand with the people who use that research, you get new insights, new inspiration, can ask different questions. And when those end users work hand in hand with the scientists, it makes it so much easier to translate those discoveries into tangible outcomes. In defence science, it's imperative that our primary focus be on the Australian Defence Force. They are our customers, our end users of our research, and that's how we meet the needs of our nation. And that could be in terms of new defence capability or supporting things like the current COVID-19 environment or responding to bushfires. Defence science in Australia, as both an organisation and an institution, is 113 years old. And just recently, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of our Fisherman's Bend site in the busy industrial district of Port Melbourne. With just over 2,000 staff across the country that were described by Minister Linda Reynolds a few weeks ago in question time as some of the smartest men and women in our nation, we are Australia's second last, sorry, second last, second largest public science agency. And last year, I had the great honour of being appointed as Australia's Chief Defence Scientist. My job is to ensure that through science and technology, we support the development of defence capability and meet defence and national security needs of our nation. And in doing so, we help the ADF defend Australia and its national interests. Now, in the past, a nation's ability to defend its interests and deter its adversaries, defeat its opponents, were largely determined by the count of aircraft, warships and boots on the ground. And as observed by the Napoleonic era Prussian strategist Karl van Clausewitz, military advantage was about mass, weight and a concentration of force. However, today's technological developments and the world's hyperconnectivity are transforming the characteristics of warfare. The deterrence that was once afforded by distance has now given away to the perils of proximity. Nations and non-state actors can employ cyber attacks and other elements of hybrid warfare that exploit that grey area between peace and war. And the emergence of new technologies and capabilities like hypersonic weapons, high speed and long range missiles and machine learning increasingly challenges those traditional military capabilities. All of this is playing out globally, but especially in our multipolar dynamic complex Indo-Pacific region. Today, military advantage is contingent on information, data, intelligence, speed and networks, preparedness and adaptability. To prevail in this contested environment, Australia needs a modern military force equipped for modern warfare. And I would contend that the role of defence science and technology in the defence of our nation has never been more important. But we cannot do this alone. Rather, we must draw on the best ideas and the innovation potential of our nation. So with all of that in mind, I'd like to share our work with you. We have extended Australia's horizons. The Jindalee operational radar network, known as JORN, consists of three over-the-horizon radar systems. These electronic sentries surveil Australia's northern sea and air approaches, scanning out to between 1,000 and 3,000 kilometres. Now, defence scientists started researching JORN technologies about, well, back in the 1970s, about 50 years ago. And it began operations 20 years ago. Unlike traditional radars that are limited by line of sight, 
Dawn makes use of the ionosphere above the Earth's surface to bounce high-frequency radio signals. Our scientists have partnered with a team from the University of Adelaide that has developed a cryogenic sapphire clock. This clock is so precise that it only gains or loses a second every 40 million years. With this unparalleled precision, we can be confident that future upgrades to JORN will allow us to continue to lead the world in this technology. Now turning to our air capability, which is crucial for the defence of Australia. The 2016 Defence White Paper made the compelling case for a potent and technologically advanced adva air combat and strike capability in the form of a fifth generation air force. But how do we ascertain the life of an aircraft? How do we know it remains safe to fly? Because if we retire an aircraft too early, it costs money and we jeopardise capability. If we retire an aircraft too late, we put lives at risk. What's the Goldilocks zone? Well, back in 1949, one of our scientific engineers wrote a paper, and that paper was called The Life of Aircraft Structures. His colleagues then went on to test 222 Mustang fighter wings and wrote a manual about aircraft fatigue. Both of these publications gave birth to real expertise here in Australia, which has enabled our aircraft to fly further for longer and extended their service life by many years. And since that time, we have saved the Australian taxpayer tens of billions of dollars, supporting the safe life extension of F-111s, the uh, F-A-18 Hornets, Hercules and Orions and other aircraft. Today, we're using the same principles to do, extend the life of our latest jets, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, so that our nation can get the very best capability from the world's most sophisticated stealth fighter. What about protecting our troops? Well, every single day, Australian soldiers use metrics developed by Defence Science and Technology to reduce the risk of injury or death from heat stress. And when our soldiers are on active duty in the Bushmaster armoured mobility vehicles, these four-wheel drives may soon be protected from explosives by, wait for it, water. An armoured vehicle on patrol carries hundreds of litres of water so that our engineers thinking, how do we make it safer, popped to Bunnings, bought some jerry cans and tested what happens in an explosion. They demonstrated that if you position the water in the right places, it can absorb energy and thus help protect its crew. Who would have thought that water could form as an alternate form of armour? To me, this is quintessentially Australian innovation. Defence's confidence in the Cooperative Research Centre model established by Professor Slatcher is demonstrated through our establishment of the first Defence CRC in Trusted Autonomous Systems. The, the CRC was established under the Next Generation Technology Fund and has had $50 million worth of defence investment over seven years. It brings together industry and researchers to work on next generation machine human teaming so that we can amplify the effect of single humans in difficult contested environments. So where are we headed? Well, history tells us that predicting the future is difficult. And indeed, less than eight years after the Wright brothers first piloted those self-powered aeroplanes, Ferdinand Foch, the French general and military theorist, declared that while aeroplanes were Interesting scientific toys, they are of no military value. He would go on to become the supreme allied commander in the First World War. In my own field, photonics, when in 1960 the laser was first invented in a lab, it was thought to be simply a scientific curiosity, but I'd challenge any of us today to go through a day without sending photons scouring around the world as we do a Google search or using light when we buy our groceries at a supermarket checkout. But in defence, our responsibilities require us to make predictions and to explore how technologies might evolve into the future. 
So what we do is we continually assess and predict and reassess the strategic environment. We make forecasts on technology development, which we call tech road mapping. We do all of these things to anticipate the challenges to our nation and make sure that we are prepared for future challenges. Australia's military is a modestly sized defence force in a globally comparative terms. And as a middle power, Australia plays an important role in ensuring a more prosperous, secure and free Indo-Pacific region, one in which the global rules-based order and the sovereignty of nations is respected, and one where there is cooperation and economic interdependence, not confrontation and conflict. Therefore, our defence forces need to be capable, agile and potent. So how does defence science support this requirement? Well, earlier this month, Minister Linda Reynolds launched the new Defence Science and Technology Strategy, which is called More Together. Traditionally, much of Australia's R&D has been bottom-up. And unlike many nations, much of our R&D happens in our universities and relatively little in our industry. This new strategy, More Together, seeks to invert that process. And the core concept in the strategy is the concept of missions that can focus and grow scale around some of Australia's biggest problems. We have named these missions Science, Technology and Research Shots, or Star Shots for short. And just like the moonshot inspired a generation to study science and engineering, the Star Shots aim to be aspirational and inspirational goals. They are devised to unlock the creativity of Australia and shape and align the research that happens in our universities and to support the development of industry capability. For these star shots to be successful, we must harness research expertise from across the country, both in our universities and in our publicly funded research agencies. I'd like to give a couple of examples. Many of you would remember those scenes from World War I and II movies where the generals synchronised their watches before an attack. Today, our forces use the US GPS system to do the same thing. We use that system for precision-guided weapons and to coordinate and synchronise distributed forces. The timing aspects of these systems are used in communications, in cryptography, to timestamp intelligence and to synchronise distributed computer systems. And when that's under threat due to conflict, we just don't have an alternative. Another problem with GPS is it doesn't work in all environments, whether that be underground, underwater, or in a complex urban setting. So what happens? What do we do if we lose GPS? Well, the quantum assured Position, navigation and timing star shot is being developed from what we sometimes think of as the second quantum revolution. We are looking to harness the unprecedented sensitivity we can get through sensors, things like gravity meters, accelerometers, magnetometers and precision clocks. It's expected that these are some of the ingredients we need to be able to generate an alternative to GPS. But we cannot do this alone, just through defence. Connecting with industry and academia is absolutely fundamental, and we recognise that Australia has world-leading R&D in our universities in this area. We've also established a global cooperation program with the UK, the US, Canada and New Zealand, with a really clear and concrete goal to bring together these technologies in a demonstration on a New Zealand frigate in 2024, which is not far away, and demonstrate what does and doesn't work. Where will we be in 10 years? We will have an alternative to GPS, and it will operate in contested environments and give that assured position navigating and timing that we need. This is an amazing opportunity to really harness real strengths Australia has and deliver industry capability and real capability for the ADF and save Australian lives. What about space? Well, in November last year, NATO formally declared space an operational domain. 
Space provides important capability for defence because we use it for comms, for position, navigation and timing and to get Earth observation products. But space is changing and fast. As well as becoming contested, it's becoming congested. These traditional satellite capabilities we rely on are becoming challenged and new technology is required. So enter the Space Starshot, which seeks to develop resilient smart satellite networks to allow the ADF to get data wherever they are on the globe. To achieve that, we have to develop a lot of autonomous technology that works in space. We'll also put technology in space that helps manage congestion by automatically manoeuvring to stay safe. Defence science has its own embryonic space capability. We've been building satellites and have launched one successfully and have another launch coming soon. But that's not enough. We're seeking to build a sovereign industrial capability to provide increased space capability for Australia. And to do that, we need to partner with great minds nationally and internationally. This is why Defence Science, through the Next Generation Technology Fund, invested $12 million to leverage just over $250 million of co-investment from industry, from universities, from government. And this allows us to do something that has not been done before in Australian history. It is the single biggest investment in space technology development in our history. These smart satellites will have significant application beyond defence. They will help us manage the quality and quantity of water, resources across the country. They will help our farmers and our miners precisely control heavy machinery from hundreds or even thousands of kilometres away. And they will also support emergency services when conventional comms are overloaded in a crisis, as we've seen recently. Through this star shot, we're also partnering with the Australian Space Agency, which was opened formally by the PM in February this year. This will help us build some of the new space infrastructure we need to support the nation's space requirements and aspirations. All of these activities mean it's a very exciting time to be interested in space in Australia. And indeed, we're working to inspire the next generation of Australians to consider studying STEM, because we know 70% of future jobs will need it. These are just two of our eight star shots We've just selected the leaders who are charged with bringing together the nation to come up with wonderful, crazy ideas, to fast fail them and to develop enduring capabilities for the nation. And please go to our website and have a look at the leaders for each of these star shots. Having ruminated on the future of defence science, this mission-oriented delivery of capability for Australia, I'd like to return to the present. Recently, we've aided Defence's response to support the frontline services during the horrendous 1920 bushfire season and the COVID-19 pandemic. As homes and lives were lost due to the fires, Australians would have seen the camouflage uniforms of the ADF supporting and assisting the colleagues in the yellow and orange attire, the firefighters and the state emergency services. And at the peak of Operation Bushfire Assist, there were more than 6,500 servicemen and women, including about 3,000 reservists, supporting relief, response and recovery efforts. While Australians would have seen that wonderful ADF contribution, you may not have realised that defence science was there playing its role. Over the Kangaroo Island and Gippsland fires, there was an aircraft flying a defence experimentation airborne platform that was undertaking missions using some of the country's most sophisticated sensors and cameras. Flying above that burning landscape, the crew used the aircraft's equipment to look through smoke and provide information on fire intensity, movement and damage to other firefighting aircraft and ground emergency responders. We also demonstrated the ability to spot fires when they were less than a metre across. This will help us respond to future bushfire seasons, which we know sadly will come. From the bushfires to the current pandemic, each year defence scientists help model and predict the scale of the influenza season 
and that experience has allowed us to make important contributions as part of the national response to COVID-19. We contribute through providing modelling to the Australian Health Protection Principles Committee and similarly working with colleagues at the University of Melbourne and the University of Adelaide, we've developed some forecasting on how, how transmissible and severe the virus is likely to be in Australia. We also work with CSIRO to understand how long a virus can survive on surfaces such as banknotes. In late March, I was tasked to lead a rapid response group to help increase domestic stocks of invasive ventilators. Simply put, invasive ventilation involves a tube helping a critically ill patient when they can no longer breathe on their own. Within a space of about three weeks, our wonderful engineers had designed a device that could convert the existing stockpile of non-invasive ventilators into those invasive ventilators for use in intensive care units. This involved fast failing a number of prototypes and testing their safety in partnership with universities and medical professionals. And this device now stands ready to be manufactured should the need arise, whether that be within Australia or some of our neighbouring nations. Defence Science also partnered with a family-owned South Australian busy business called Axiom Precision Manufacturing to produce face shields for healthcare workers on the front line. We designed and prototyped these face shields using 3D printing and rapidly transitioned them to Axiom, who could then mass produce them using injection moulding techniques. A wonderful story coming out of this is that not only were these Australian designed and made face shields made here and quickly, but they were more comfortable and cheaper than imports. And the first batch of 600 face shields went to South Australian hospitals for evaluation and 4,000 are now being produced. This is just a set of examples of how we in defence are working across industry and academia. So ladies and gentlemen, when I reflect on defence science, I'm really excited about the role we play in shaping Australia's future and the relationships we're fostering. We're partnering with all 37 of Australia's public universities under our new defence science partnering deed. We're deepening our partnerships with the other publicly funded research organisations like CSIRO, ANSTO, the Bureau of Meteorology and other associations like our learned academies. We currently have 12 strategic alliances with major defence primes and work across multiple cooperative research centres and a range, a growing range of small to medium enterprises. And it gives me great joy to see some wonderful science coming out of DST, being turned into startups and starting to create new small to medium enterprises. As Defence Science and our partners continue to work collaboratively in a mission oriented way to develop capabilities Australia needs, I believe we will grow the alignment between Australia's wonderful R&D capabilities and these big problems. But this is going to take cooperation and time and commitment. Our research and development will provide the country with powerful new technologies that will find clever and unanticipated uses in other areas, such as health, agriculture, mining and environmental monitoring. But it will also build new capabilities in industry and research, and I hope inspire more kids to study the subjects that set them up for wonderful careers. I'd like to acknowledge the Prime Minister's remarks right here yesterday at the Press Club about building on Australia's world leading strengths and about the really critical role that research and development play in setting up Australia for economic success. Defence science will give our men and women a capability advantage so they can prevail in that challenging contested environment. So is Australia up to the challenge? in this changing world with ever increasing uncertainty? Well, my reflection on the challenges we've risen to, whether that be bushfires or COVID-19, is absolutely because there's nothing like a problem. And you give our nation a problem, we come together to solve it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time.